You're listening to international investment advisor Doug Goldstein on the Goldstein on Yelp Show, the financial show where we'll talk about how you can make the most of your money. With all the confusing financial chatter bombarding you each and every day, Goldstein on Yelp will give you the practical information you want and need about living a financially stable life. Here's your host, money maven, Doug Goldstein. Okay, we are back. We are talking to Nicholas Shaxon. He's a British writer, journalist, and investigator. He's also the author of the book Treasure Islands, Tax Havens, and the Men Who Stole the World. Nicholas, great to have you on the show. Hi, how are you? So before we get into the whole discussion of the book, maybe you could define for us exactly what is a tax haven? Well, there's no general agreement as to what a tax haven is. Uh, there are lots of uh, official definitions out there by the IMF and others, and they focus on things like tax rates and secrecy and things like that. Um, basically, these places sell a whole range of services, um, low or zero taxes, loopholes and so on is one very big part of it. Secrecy is another big part of it. Escape from criminal laws uh, of other jurisdictions is another part of it. But essentially, if you boil all of these factors together um, and boil them down to what they really the essence of it, um, you, you kind of reach two things. One is this this concept of escape. You're escaping from the responsibilities of society. So you're escaping from tax, you're escaping from disclosure, escaping from, you know, inheritance laws, criminal laws, whatever they are. Um, uh, and so that's one part of it. And, and usually it's a it's a wealthy elite of people. You know, we're, we're, we're talking these days about the sort of one percent against the 99 percent. This is usually the one percent we're talking about. They're escaping from the kind of constraints of society, leaving everybody else to kind of pick up the tab. Um, the other the other part of it is this word elsewhere. So um, what tax havens do is they offer services for citizens elsewhere. So the laws of the Cayman Islands, for example, are not designed directly to affect the uh, citizens of the Cayman Islands. They are targeted at citizens and corporations from the United States or Latin America or Africa or, or wherever. So it's a kind of this, this you know, the, the, the word tax haven is often associated with the word offshore and that offshore thing really kind of captures the elsewhere thing. So it's kind of you take your money elsewhere to escape from what you don't like. That's really what tax havens are about. So you mentioned that secrecy and you, you compared it to some sort of escape. Is secrecy these days a dirty word? Because when I grew up, I thought it was OK to to be modest and secret with your life. Yes, it is becoming a dirty word. I mean, there is a there is a distinction to be made here between um, legitimate confidentiality and privacy and, 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 and that kind of thing and secrecy. Now, on the one hand, you have legitimate confidentiality. So you, you go to a doctor and, you know, you have some medical condition. The doctor is not going to kind of hammer up the details of that onto his uh, surgery door. And in the same way, a bank won't, you know, your bank details, it won't plaster your bank details all over the Internet. It will keep these confidential uh, and that's perfectly legitimate. What happens with secrecy, though, is when if you take your money elsewhere, um, governments have a need to tax their citizens, including their wealthy citizens, and they have a, um, a legitimate right to know if their citizens are taking their money elsewhere, what's happening to that money. And so you need to have you, you absolutely have to have in this globalization, in this globalized world, um, cooperation between governments. You have to have transparency in that respect. Governments will share information with each other um, in some cases and they won't, but they won't publish those. Um, so that's kind of what's what's happening. But secrecy is like Swiss bank secrecy when, you know, the U United States or Israel or someone or, or another country will come to Switzerland and say, look, we've got we know that we've got our citizens um, parking money in your banks and, and tell us about it. And Switzerland will turn around and say, uh, I'm sorry, we can't disclose that information. Um, so it, this is the, the, the culture of this is really changing now. There was, you know, there was a real kind of lackadaisical attitude to this in the past and sort of nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Um, was, it, was it lackadaisical or was it simply that people felt that every individual had the right to privacy? That that was part of the whole ideology, but behind behind it all was a kind of complacency. You know, the global economy was glow, it was growing. There was a general acceptance that the world economy was kind of doing okay. And okay, if we can't tax our citizens, it's not great, and we should do something about it. But uh, but let's you know, we've got other things to worry about. I think now we see people um, much more interested. Governments facing huge deficits, economic crisis. Where are we going to get the money from? Why have the, you know, the elites uh, taken all the, you know, the huge share of national income, leaving almost nothing for anybody else? And um, there's a sudden huge interest in this issue and it's really rising very fast indeed. Um, so I think what you're saying is this, you know, this kind of justification of secrecy was just part of the kind of ideology that was, um, you know, 
people were accepting it. They were accepting these arguments. I don't think people are accepting these arguments nearly so readily these days. So you've used the term offshore and offshore tax haven, but I've also heard you talk about the fact that the UK and the US the, are are big tax havens as well. How can that be if they're if they are yes. so onshore? Indeed. Well. Th- for various different reasons, the United States uh, is a tax haven, uh, according to any classical definition. Huge, huge volumes of money flow to the United States and they will be protected by secrecy. The United States will not share that information with other governments. Um, and it has taken deliberately, it has deliberately taken steps to avoid sharing that information. The details are quite complex, complicated. But I remember one of one of the first um, ways that I got interested in this whole issue, I was um researching some corruption in oil producing countries in Africa and an an attorney in New York contacted me and said he wanted to talk to me. So next time I was there, I went and spoke to him and he started talking to me about tax exemptions and uh, uh, things like that. And I I, I was thinking, you know, what's this got to do with anything? And what he was trying to tell me was that the United States had been offering secrecy facilities, had been offering tax exemptions to foreigners in order to attract money to the United States. Not only that, but this was a central element of the US efforts to fill its uh, trade deficits and its uh, fiscal deficits as well. Um, It was absolutely central to the whole game. And it was then I realized how important this was. This was about financing deficits. This was not just some kind of marginal exotic thing on the fringes of the global economy. This was right right at the centre of things. And that's when I began to realise just how important it was. Um, the, the UK is another, um, I would describe it as a ta- tax haven in a, in a slightly different way. Uh, I mean, of course, you can uh, avoid, you can get secrecy in the UK, you can avoid taxes u- using the UK. But in Treasure Islands, what I describe most is, um, I was talking about escape, offering escape routes. What the UK really offered um, from about the mid, from about the 1960s onwards, was escape from financial regulation. So you had this, the growth, growth of this market in London, so the, the so-called euro dollar market, um, which was effectively a, a market that allowed US banks to come to London and do in London what they were not allowed to do at home. So in those days, um, Wall Street was very much tied down with all sorts of um, New, Deal, fin- New Deal era financial regulations. And the, the American economy was growing very strongly at the time, but they didn't like those constraints. So they came to London, they found this escape route. Um, and so in, the, in those terms, you know, I'm describing the UK in, in, in my very broad terms as a kind of escape route from whatever it is that they don't like. And in this case, it was very much financial regulation. Mm-hmm. We are talking to Nick Shaxson, who referred a moment ago to a book he wrote a few years ago called Poisoned Wells, The Dirty Politics of African Oil. And he's also the author of Treasure Islands, Tax Havens and the Men Who Stole the World. He's been explaining to us about secrecy and about how, the, in fact, the U.S. and the U.K. themselves are tax havens. When the U.S. makes demands of other countries to supply the IRS information, let's say you have a small bank in Israel or Switzerland or, or anywhere for that matter, is the IRS using its, its strong arm to pressure these other institutions simply to become tax collectors for them, to become the long arm of the IRS? Well, I think that there, there, the U.S. is indo- indeed doing that. It is um, pressing other countries to not to be the tax collectors necessarily, but to help the United States enforce its laws. What has happened really is you had financial globalization, money speeding all around the world. And this creates this enormous problem. There's a huge fault line in the whole globalization project. If you have secrecy, markets don't work as they're supposed to um, and governments can't collect the taxes that they're supposed to off their citizens. And uh, it is a real sort of breakdown. Um, and so you do have this kind of if you don't like uh, tax taxes and tax collection, then you will you will describe it as the sort of U.S. bullying and strong arms tactics and things like that. But if you if you think that, you know, society, you know, societies have to pay for themselves and governments have to find, you know, finance themselves and everybody has to make a contribution, then you will see this as a kind of legitimate exercise of the United States trying to protect its own tax base from offshore erosion. Now, that leaves aside those sort of aspects of hypocrisy. The United States is hypocritical, of course, by being a tax haven in its own right, <laughs> sucking out huge amounts of money from other countries and um, <laughs> secrecy to, uh, to, to, you know, wealthy tax evading and often criminal elites. Uh, but that's that's another another aspect to it. But uh, so are is- there ways are there ways to police the tax havens or are they really outside of international law? It, basically, they're, they're 
there is no magic bullet. There's no sort of uh, single way to, to address this problem. The United States has recently put in place some very strong legal actions that are just starting to come and come into place, um, which protect itself, protect its own uh, financial, its own fiscal base from offshore erosion. And that focuses quite heavily on the intermediaries, the bankers and so on to police, uh, <laughs> police their, you know, their tax system. Now, that is um, uh, one one aspect of it. And the United States is probably a leader in this respect. It is very much uh, it is very much doing uh, doing this uh, where other countries have taken a much more sort of fatalistic, you know, we can't do anything that, about this kind of attitude. But the other sort of main. So, so this is individual countries can protect themselves up to a point. The United States will, will never catch all of it, um, but it will. You know, it is a powerful country and it can go quite a long way. But the other aspect, if you want to really do something about this, you have uh, international cooperation and there are some sort of fairly feeble efforts at international cooperation. The OECD, the group of uh, the club of rich countries, has put in place some some facilities which kind of help. Um, they, they haven't done a very good job of it yet. Uh, the European Union has an information sharing mechanism uh, going on within the EU, which is kind of working, but it's full of loopholes. So international cooperation is happening, but it's still pretty weak. And because you have this great fault line in globalization, it does need to get stronger. And particularly these days when governments are trying to collect taxes from their own citizens, um, there is a real imperative to uh, to strengthen this whole thing. But, uh, you know, within uh, with all the troubles in Europe and so on, uh, it's it's hard to see progress being made at a great pace at the moment. It also seems like quite an uphill battle because many of the people who use the offshore tax havens exactly for the reasons that you're concerned about, like for secrecy and tax avoidance or evasion, are from uh, mafia, they're dictators, they're terrorists. They have a very strong interest to try and keep this system going for as long as possible. Is it given that, can we expect other than other than the US protecting its own interests, uh, can we expect that to change or do you think that there will always be offshore tax haven use? There will always be off. There have always been tax havens since the beginning of time. It's always been possible to take your money elsewhere and do do with it what you're not allowed to do at home. Um, it's really since the sort of 60s and 70s when you had kind of changes in technology allowing you to transfer money at the click of a mouse, and um, uh, you'd had a sort of sudden sort of acceleration in financial globalization and the explosion in the use of offshore tax havens. Um, so, and you have always had, you know, mafiosi and criminals and drug smugglers, whatever using tax havens. But what's what's been most striking about the, the era of globalization, it is it is now very much corporations that are the biggest users of tax havens and particularly financial corporations. So you will have in a you know in a place like the British Virgin Islands, which is a very kind of mucky little cat tax haven in the Caribbean, you will have um, banks uh, and you know drug smugglers and criminals using this same jurisdiction, kind of rubbing shoulders with each other. And and, and the, the corporations will be using it for what are usually legal reasons they they can use these tax havens to structure their businesses so that they can cut their tax bills without necessarily breaking the law um, but then you have them kind of rubbing shoulders with a much more criminal element and it, it, it all happens in secrecy in this in this uh, you know in these strange little offshore jurisdictions and, and it's but I think it's profoundly dangerous this this process of, of, of the all these different interests meeting in this kind of these sort of libertarian places where kind of anything goes and it's all covered in secrecy and you could do what you like I think is profoundly dangerous for, for global capitalism. Okay, we have been talking to Nicholas Shaxon, who wrote the book Treasure Islands, Tax Havens, and the Men Who Stole the World. Fascinating read. He's also quite uh, quite experienced around having lived in many, many different countries and seen many different ways that tax uh, tax authorities work. Nick, in the last couple of seconds, could you just tell people how they could follow your work? Uh, yes, I have a website, treasureislands.org.org. Um, you can read my book, uh, Treasure Islands, Tax Havens, The Men Who Stole the World. Um, and and that's, uh, yeah, that, that's who I am. Great. Nick Shaxon, thanks so much. Thank you. You've been listening to The Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. 
It's your money for your future. So join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show. 